This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, three-time Grammy-nominated lyricist Pamela Phillips Oland, has written over 500 songs that have been recorded and enjoyed in the U.S. and around the world. Her work has been recorded by no less than the spectacular talents of Aretha Franklin and the Four Tops, Frank Sinatra, Whitney Houston and Jermaine Jackson, Anne Murray, Philip Bailey, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Gladys Knight, Reba McIntyre, Peebo Bryson, The Jacksons, Engelbert Humperdinck, Dusty Springfield, The Crusaders, The Whispers, The Brothers Johnson, DJ Ralphie Rosario, Michael Learns to Rock, and Selena. Pamela's lyrics can be heard in movies and on TV shows that include The Sopranos, Coming to America, 102 Dalmatians, Burglar, Jag, Xena Warrior Princess, Gideon, Kids' Ten Commandments, and Blizzard, which was nominated for a Genie Award for Best Song in a Motion Picture. Pamela is the sole lyricist for Argentinian diva Karen Souza, including co-writing the hit song Paris. Pamela has given multiple seminars on songwriting, including at Carnegie Hall, at music conservatories around Denmark, and in Australia and Finland. She taught her craft for eight years at UCLA and was part of the historic Music Speaks Louder Than Words event, the first ever creative exchange between U.S. and Soviet songwriters and artists in Moscow and Leningrad. Her musical, Soldier of Orange, is in its ninth sold-out year in Holland. With almost three million tickets sold, it's the most successful musical in Dutch history. Soldier of Orange is about to be workshopped in London, where a new immersive theater is being built for it in Newham, near London City Airport. Producers are planning to open it there in late 2020. Other musicals that Pamela is currently developing are Chick, Wonder, which is a Stevie Wonder musical, and Touch Me, a rock show. Beyond writing hundreds of songs, Pamela has also published two books, The Art of Writing Great Lyrics and The Art of Writing Love Songs. So for all of those reasons and many more, it is my great honor and privilege to chat with the powerhouse lyricist Pamela phillips Oland on StoryBeat today. Pamela, welcome to the show. Steve, a pleasure to be here. So let's go back to the beginning, which is where I like to start. Which, when did you start writing lyrics? How did you get into this in the first place? I began writing poetry. Uh, I was a, uh, I grew up in London, and my mother wanted me to speak the Queen's English so that I would be able to mix with the right kind of society. Mm-hmm. So she sent me to this wonderful teacher named Gloria Brent, who, if you tied her hands behind her back, could not speak. <laughs> she was very <laughs> dramatic. And she taught me many <laughs> poems, and I would go to these contests around London, and I would uh, recite the same poem as, you know, 40 other little girls from around London. And I would win because she was so, it, she was so wonderful at what she did. Mm-hmm. And so learning all these poems and learning cadence and then learning ballet, I studied at the Arts Educational, which was called the Cone Ripman at that time. Uh, in London, and I learned how, and the teachers would make you walk around the room and go, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and you'd bend your knees on the one, (laughs) and if you didn't, they would stick a a, a stick behind your knees. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, all of that, my dad was a musician in London, so I had all these wonderful musicians coming to the house and jamming in our living room, so it was all music, and the lyrics were poetry, so I started writing poetry, and I wrote a number of angst-filled poems about boys um, when I was in high school. <laughs> and then I went to London one year. Uh, I actually went I went to school in Paris for the summer at the Sorbonne. Uh, and then I realized that I had been uprooted from London when I was nine, and I wanted to go and see if I really would have preferred to live there. 
I was coming of sort of age at this point where I could choose who I wanted to be. About what age is that, Pamela? About 18. 18. About 18. So I went to London, and um, I stayed with an aunt, and I have found this place called the Oxford and St. George uh, Foundation, which was in the east end of London. Uh, actually, very near to where my show is going to be, which is very right. interesting. But I, it was in it was in a poor neighborhood, um, and I and the, and the latchkey kids would come in there after school, and um, kind of hang out. They're about fifteen, sixteen years old. They were almost my age, but I was the American, and I was the oh, everybody you know wanted to be my friend, and it was very sweet. Um, and I gave them advice, <laughs> what you, advice you can give at eighteen years old. Yes. But anyway, there was this one boy who was sort of an outcast. He wasn't the popular boy, and he was sort of a little bit round and, you know, just kind of reticent. And he, uh, he said, one day he said to me, can I teach you to play the guitar? Well, my father had, had forced me to play the violin. He was a violinist, <clears throat> and I played violin, and I had become first violin of junior orchestra in school, although I couldn't read. I, I have a, it's just one of those mind things that you cannot it looks like little black dots on paper to this day i couldn't i couldn't see it yeah so i i had given up the violin and besides which i wanted fingernails (laughs) (laughs) terribly shallow and then i'd learned piano and uh my father taught me that too so i had a bit of piano skill but i had never intended to learn guitar and he said may i please teach you guitar and i and because he you know it was kind of a kindness, a mitzvah, that I would I would let him teach me guitar. Mm. So I decided I would let him, and I um, and I schlepped across London to get to his place, which was, you know, several trains and buses to get there. And he rented a room in somebody, at 15, he had no parents, renting a room in somebody's house, and this little room, and uh, I went in there, and we sat and talked, and he was very eager. He gave me a guitar to play, and I sat there, and he told me how to hold it. And and after a few times going over there, I was passably good on a few chords. Huh. So, segue to, and I wish I knew, I wish I knew who remembered his name or what happened to him. I, I would so do something for him if I could. I just don't know. I, I just don't know if I would ever find him, but... Anyway, I, I got back to America, and my dad, we lived in Vegas by this time, and my dad was a um, strip musician, and he he had this friend that was uh, uh, importing cheap guitars from Japan. Right. <laughs> uh, I was in conversation. My dad was said to me, you know, what did you do in America? In London, rather. What did you do in London? Oh, I did this, I did that, I worked here, I did this. Oh, and by the way, this guy taught me a few chords on the guitar. Oh, you play the guitar? <laughs> said, well, I, that's taking it a bit far, <laughs> but I, I know how to play a few chords. And the next thing I knew, my father had bought me a, a, a cheap Japanese guitar wow. that was, you know, very, very nothing, nothing fancy. And I took it and I started t- taking all those angst-filled poems and putting them to music. Isn't that interesting? And so- that's how I started writing songs. Who knew I would ever write songs? And they were awful. The first several hundred were all in A minor. <laughs> that was the only key I'd grown up with. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm going to bet three chords, and that was it, right? <laughs> well, I, I may have had a couple, a few more than that. But <laughs> it, it, so, and, and you didn't read music then, and you still don't read music? I still don't read music. It's and all by ear. It's all by ear. I do write music, and uh, I do it in my head. Well, I suppose uh, I, I'm, I'm, I would be described as a hummer by the by those who call it. Hummer. I, I will I, I will have you know that we we share that in common. I you know I've written a number of of musicals and and all words and I don't know how to read music and I can't play, so it's all by ear. It's by ear, and, and I eventually I don't really play. I mean, I have a guitar, I have a piano, I have. A, I just bought a, a second home in uh, in Las Vegas um, on a lake. Beautiful, by the way, gorgeous. Oh mm. my God! But uh, the first thing I bought for that is a keyboard, and I got a really nice Yamaha keyboard that does everything but make lunch. And <laughs> and, uh, and and so far, several people have been over and playing and writing, and it's great, you know, because you have to have have one. But you know, it kind of gave me. I think everything happens for a reason. 
And I, if I you agree. believe in God, I then agree. God gives you different gifts. And the gift I was supposed to follow the most was going to be language, mm-hmm. because I responded to language from the very early age and working with Gloria Brent and poetry and all of that and learning what words mean and the cadence of words and the the sound of words and the expression of words and the um when I was a little girl I remember my father saying to me that something was infinitesimal <laughs> now I was a I was a kid you know I don't even know how young I was but I said, Daddy, what does that mean? And he said, it means very, very small. He had a British, very British accent. Yes. And I said, well, if it means very, very small, why didn't you just say very, very small instead of infinitesimal? <laughs> and he said, because I meant infinitesimal. <laughs> 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 and I, and it, uh, years later, I was, I, remember, I was 28 years old one day, and I was in a thesaurus looking for a perfect word for something that meant small. And I saw the word infinitesimal sitting there with a long line of other words. And I looked it up and found out that it was microscopically small. And I, uh, and then I realized, I started looking at all the words that meant small in that, in that one entry in the thesaurus, good old Roger, right? Roger. And I looked at that and I said, oh, my goodness. There are so many, you you can't call a child infinitesimal, and you can't call an atom little. You, there really are shades of meaning. Sure. And so I became a great lover of shades of meaning, and all through my songwriting career, I have, uh, I have always tried to use language, and unfortunately, people don't use so much language anymore. It's all very, well, all very simple. They use it, they use it in, um, I would say rather n- not interesting ways, and I think it's your job, is it not, as a writer of lyrics, to find the perfect words? Right, right. And I, I'll give you the words, and sometimes they say, "Can you change that word?" And I'll change it. And um, <laughs> once, oh, what was that word? That was a song that I gave. Um, I gave to. I was working with Leon Silvers, and uh, oh my gosh, I, I have to see if I can conjure up the story but it was a i used a word in a lyric oh yes the first the song was called acrobat right and it was for a group called um um oh my god crystal and yeah and so the first line of the song was love is stealthy as a thief (laughs) you turn around your heart is gone and he sat there and he looked at it for a minute and he said what is this stealthy and I said, I knew you would ask that. Turn the page. And I had typed a dictionary definition <laughs> of stealthy. It was, it was the funniest thing. It was so silly that I did that. But he's like, oh, got it. And I said, I can change it. And he said, no, no, no. It's the bomb. I love it. I want to use it. We'll keep it there. And um, I never did that again. Um, but I, it was... I, it's so important that the word be the right word. I probably wouldn't use that word in a song again because it's too hard to say. It, and it, there are song words, and then there are speaking words. Right, and, and that's, so, song words, correct me if I'm wrong, tend um, tend to be relatively simple and not um, overly academic or intellectual or complex. That's right. That's the difference. That's one of the differences that I identified between poetry and lyrics. I went to a publisher when I was a staff writer over at A and M. Well, it was Rondor Music, Alma Irving Music. Um, it was Jer- Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss's company. Sure. And I was a staff writer there for five years. And when I was there, I mean, I I, I took a song to the publisher, and uh, Alan, his name was Alan, Alan Ryder, and he said to me, "That's a poem, not a lyric." And I said, well, how do you know? He said, I just know. <laughs> I said, well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> it's, it's like the, the, fam- the famous definition of pornography. You know, you, you, you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. You know it when you see it, right? And I said, well, how am I going to fix it if I don't know what, I don't, he's, you know, if I don't know what I'm doing wrong? Anyway, when I wrote my first book, The Art of Writing Great Lyrics, which was first called You Can Write Great Lyrics, which I thought was a wonderful title until Amazon came along and everything was alphabetized. (laughs) And then I went to the art of writing great lyrics. 
<laughs> I wanted an A. Um, but but the the you know when I thought about it, um, you, you just it, it's just really important to you know, have the right word. You know, I don't know. Uh, well, I, th- I think if without the right word, it the whole thing, or maybe not, but but a good part of it, if, if not the whole thing, collapses. The the, uh-huh. the right words make a difference. It's a little. It's actually true for almost any kind of writing, from my perspective. Though you can right. get away with a lot more in, say, a television script or in a movie script than you can right. in a lyric, which is yeah. very specific. You've... Yes, and the po- and I had to define for the for the right for the songwriter what you would when when your your song became a poem, which line became a poem a poetry line, a poetic line. And I defined it so that basically um, poetry is of your mind. You really have to read it over and over. And a word like stealthy, you might want to read that ten times before you really understand what it means. Sure. But if it's in a song, it's going to you're going to get stuck on listening to that and trying to figure out what was that line. And you want to go and, and, and it stops the song dead. So... Um, Really, there are there are several definitions. So when I did write that book, I I did go to uh, that uh, definitions of what lyric, the differences are between lyrics and poetry. And in my second book, I added more. I also assume that you uh, think about, or at this point in you know, if you've written so many songs, there are words that you don't ever use because they're difficult to sing. Like phlegm. <laughs> phlegm. Yeah, there, yeah. There's a word that would come up in any love song. Phlegm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I love you like a Louis I hawked up or something like that. I don't know what you would do with phlegm. <laughs> Maybe on Broadway there might be a shot. Yes. <laughs> Anything goes on Broadway now, really. Truly. So, so you started to write. You're now in your late teens, early 20s, and you're writing, writing, writing. And at what point did you... Well, when did you make your first sale? At what point did you make your first good sale? I, uh, well, I was sitting writing songs on the beach. You know, I I was working for, I had moved to L.A. And I uh, was, I was working, well, I was, I was an intern. Oh, you'll like this. I went to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Right. And I decided to take a sociology course. I was interested in, I was doing journalism and I was doing public relations. That was sort of where I was focusing my interests in college and and I got into a class and uh, I think the the, the 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 teacher was Dr. Greenblatt it seems that was his name anyway it was a class in sociology and we had to do a field experience and the field experience was for almost everyone going into the parole office working in there you know doing these field experiences the parole office the probation office the jail you know really heavy duty socially conscious things. And the, this wonderful teacher, this Dr. Greenblatt, he said, um, okay, you're going to Caesar's Palace. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Caesar's Palace? He said, yes, you're going to work in the PR department, and you're going to have to come to class every uh, week, and you're going to have to talk about your field experience there, helping people and working with people. So I became an intern at Caesar's Palace, which was great fun, uh, and um, and I, you know, would report back on things like somebody having drinks spilled down their clothes. Which <laughs> I don't know, you know, everything is important to who it's important to. Of course, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, really, it... truly. So I became very good friends. I was sort of a mascot. I was the youngest person, you know, working there in that in the actually offices. And so I came to the attention of Jerry Gordon, who was a very famous uh, hotel manager at Caesar's Palace. He's you know, a legendary guy. And Jerry said, well, there's this job in Los Angeles this summer. A summer would you like to have a summer job in L.A.? The guy who used to run the, uh, the PR department at Fling- Flamingo Hotel has opened a, P- a PR agency in Los Angeles. W- would you like to go work for him for the summer? Oh, my God, yeah, that would be so exciting. So I went to L.A. to do it, and his company the guy's company folded the day I got to it <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up uh, I had been working for lawyers during college I worked for the district attorney in Las Vegas and I worked for yeah that was where I worked um I worked for the chief of chief investigator Jack Ruggles and 
I and you know, uh, and then I, um, well, I just had that was the only kind of job I knew I could do was working for lawyers. So I got a job working for a company called Mitchell Silverberg and Up, which happened to be the number one entertainment law firm in L.A. It, literally, I walked down. I was staying at my aunt's house, and I walked down the street to the nearest employment agency, and they were in the same building as Mitchell Silverberg and Up, or next door. Right. And uh, so they had the Beach Boys and the Beatles and the, everything. They had everybody you could possibly think of that you would that would be important and every record label, every everything. They were just those guys, Ape Summer and all these guys were so um and Phil, Phillips, um I can't Lee Phillips, these incredibly powerful attorneys in the entertainment. Especially music. Oh my God, especially music. They were the music firm. And um so I made friends and I had got my first cut and I actually uh had one of the attorneys handle the contracts for me. But how I met, how I got my first cut, which is, was your question, mm-hmm. you can see how circular I am. It's hard to get an answer. From, there, <laughs> there's, so there's, a, there's, a, I, there's a song in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I've got so many things that come into my mind when you ask one question, and all of a sudden I see the whole... Ch- because I'm very interested in the chain of events. Sure, the link. To me, it's much more interesting to look at the chain of events that led to something yeah. than just to say, oh, well, this is what happened. Sure. But what happened was that my fr- when I was, I was going to move to, uh, to Vegas, to, uh, from Vegas to L.A., and I had this dear friend, and she had just broken up with her boyfriend, and she, she um, called me. And she said, I, can I come to L.A. with you? And I said, oh, you know, I was thinking I'm going to have my little hip, hippie pad, you know, <laughs> with posters on the wall, who knows. And I wasn't really wanting <clears throat> a roommate at the time. But I said, okay, well, let's meet for coffee at the Sahara Hotel. So we went to the Sahara Hotel, and we sat there, and we talked about the possibilities of her moving to L.A. with me. And after a while, we were talking about you know where we would live and maybe we could get an apartment, and it started to get exciting. And then all of a sudden, I still was on the fence. These two cowboys who were visiting Las Vegas walked over to our table in the restaurant. You know, we were just two young college girls sitting there talking, but there were many girls who were not college girls who wore slightly lower cut clothes. <clears throat> In Las Vegas at that time. Slightly. (laughs) Anyway, these two guys walked over to our table. Hey, ladies, they said, and took their hats off. And then they took their room keys and threw them in the center of the table. (laughs) And we looked at each other, and I have never laughed so hard in my entire life. The two of us (laughs) just fell out and started laughing so hard. It It was the most wonderful bonding moment. And I said, yes, you can come to L.A. with me. (laughs) <laughs> so we went to L.A., and we uh, got an apartment, and um, she got a job working, and she was an accountant, and I got, you know, I was working for the lawyers. And one day we went and played tennis at La- at Beverly Hills High School. Right. They had a, a tennis court there, and when I say played, that's a, that's giving myself a lot of credit. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we were hitting balls back and forth and on the tennis court. And um, as we, and there was a guy standing there watching us play tennis, you know, watching the game. And as we, as we left the court and we walked to the end to get our purses and so on, and he's standing there at the gate and he looks at her and says, "You've got great legs." <laughs> and I thought, "Oh, that's so nice." But then he started talking to her, and I was sort of left out of this conversation. He said nothing about my legs, so <laughs> I was. If I didn't know what to do, I wanted to be to participate. So I said the most inane thing, you know, just something that you would say if you were in a nightclub and you met somebody. So what do you do? And he said, I manage songwriters. What do you do? And I had been spending every spare moment sitting on the beach with a guitar. I get that that guitar my dad had bought me, and um, you know, writing songs. And there would usually be like 50 yards down the beach, there'd be another person sitting there with a guitar and <laughs> writing songs. <laughs> Everybody was writing songs. Um, it was the Starbucks but, of its day. Oh yes, the beach, absolutely. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, he said, "What do you do?" I said, "Well, I I write songs." And he was um, he he was very friendly with a guy named Norman Brokaw, who was the sure. head of. Yeah, he was the head of William Morris, and in fact, he even babysat his kids. And his name was Norman Ratner, and he he said, well, let me hear your songs. And he heard my songs, and he really liked what I'd done. And I got my first cut ever was Lou Rawls. 
Wow. Who was a powerhouse, a yeah. wonderful man, a brilliant voice. I went to the session and you just melted with his voice. Was it was it your music voice. as well? Yes, I wrote more Zen music. Wow. Of and then uh, the next project that came along, also from Brokaw, was uh, was Leon Silver. Or was I'm sorry, was L- Lola Falana. Lola Falana, and sure. And she she was a wonderful singer in that time. She she became ill later. She had MS, I think, but she was gorgeous woman and wonderful voice. And she was the toast of Las Vegas in the, in those days. And a great and dancer, to, yeah. Yes, and she was married to Tavares. Right. Who um, and this same guy, the Norman, produced "Rock the Boat," which was a big hit for them. Anyway, so those were my first cuts, and then after that, I was and I didn't work with him after that, and I was working, uh, freelancing, trying to find, and I did a bunch of disco, and then came along the Sinatra connection, which um, changed my life pr- profoundly. Uh, I, I everything would that imagine. happened was this chain of events that happened that led to everything that I have today. It's all it's always <laughs> it's always a linked chain of one thing to another. Oh, yes. Yes, and you can and if you go back and look at it, you can see the precise moments yeah. that um yeah. I I um I had I don't know if you want to hear any of this, but I'll, I'll just give you a, the start of it was I went to a I, have, I knew this girl very randomly, a girl named Tessa, an English girl. And I mentioned to her I was going to London for a trip. And she said, would you like to meet this music publisher friend of mine? She wasn't in the music business. And I said, oh, I'd love to. She said his name is Paul Rich. And I went to London, and I called Paul Rich, and he invited me to come see him. Mm-hmm. And I and I sat with him, and he listened to some things I'd written. And he said, um, you know, I'd like you to meet... I'd like you to write the lyrics to a song called Chanson de Anna, which I own the rights to. It's a French song. I think Michelle Legrand was the composer. I'm mm. not sure. Mm. But I think so. Chanson de Anna, he said, but, but Don Costa owns the American rights. To right. It. And I would like, when you get back to America, call Don Costa and tell him uh, that Paul Rich said that he wanted you to write the English lyrics. So I was very excited by that. I'd go back to America eventually. And I, uh, I called on Costa, and I called him for three years. I just kept calling him once a month, just calling, <laughs> leaving a message every month. No, he never called me back. Nobody ever called me, nothing. But I just kept leaving this message on this number that he gave me. And, um, and then uh, three year, two or three years later, I think, I, I was, my dance teacher was singing at a concert at a hotel on San Vicente, in Beverly Hills, on Beverly, Burton Way, actually, on um, and Dermitage. And uh, he sang this song I had written called Valentino, and I remember Oliver Reed was there, and he called out, I want to own that song. Can I buy that song? Oliver, <laughs> Oliver really, Reed said that? Oliver Reed, Oliver Reed. When, he came and sat with us. I had a date. You know, we all sat around. And so so, for, so for, today's, for today's listeners of this show, Oliver Reed was a... A spectacular British actor who's no longer with us, but he did lots of big, intense movies, especially with Ken Russell. Yeah, oh, he was wonderful, and he was larger than life um, in the way he moved. His arms were constantly in motion, and his profile and his everything was studied. Every every move that he made was a fascinating person to have met. And, mm. Uh, but anyway, it turned out that this uh, girl that I knew, who I there was a girls' group who used to have lunches in like a salon. We used to talk about books and have lunch together and so on. This girl, who I hadn't seen in a while, who was a member of that, came running over to me after the song was sung and said, Pamela, oh my God, it's good to see you. You've got to meet my partner, my boyfriend. He he had loved your song. He mm. thought it was fabulous. And uh, he's got a partner who would like to manage you. He thinks would want to manage you. Anyway, uh, so I ended up meeting them at, I met them at a, uh, um, it was a, it's called the, the, the Racket Club in L.A., it was on, over on Motor Avenue. And um, the guy owned it. And he told me a story later that he had actually been a member of Al Capone's <laughs> band. <laughs> Al Capone. <laughs> Unbelievable character, just a character, you know. And he was... 
he was talk about larger than life. He was fabulous, fascinating guy, really interesting. Anyway, um, I met him and I sang the songs, and everybody decided I should get managed. And uh, in my during the conversations with the, these guys, I, I mentioned that I'd been trying to reach Don Costa for three years and still had not met him. And the next day, I got a call from this this uh, man who owned the racket club. And he, he called me and says, I understand you want to meet Don Costa. And I, <laughs> I said, yeah, I've been trying for three years. Yes, you know, I've called him. What time? <laughs> 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 so an hour later, I was at the guy's house, and we drove up, and I met Don, who was the salt of the earth. I loved Don Costa. He was a marvelous man, and I became good friends with him. And I went to, you know, he had a, a very... A, warm family, you know, this a very effusive kind of thing. And he would and so he had like I remember a sausage stuffing party that I went over there. Sausage. And um nothing to do with songwriting, you know, just we're just stuffing sausages for <laughs> that he was making and he had this machine and everything. But uh Don um Don and I became friends and um one day I went so one day yeah, and one day oh he he said, send, send me songs, send me songs. So I started sending songs, and I never heard from him. Uh-huh. So another couple of years go by oh. with the no songs being recorded. And one night at 11 o'clock, I get a call. Hi, this is Don Costa. And he said, I just recorded a song of yours. Oh. Said, you, you did? What song was it? And he names it. I have no idea what this song is because I've written so many. I can't even remember. And I start to sing something, and he goes, no, no, that doesn't sound like it. He said, but anyway, come over here. This is how to get to my house because it's been a while since I've been there. He said, uh, come over, and uh, you'll meet the artist, and you'll hear it. The so long story short is that he had a guy named Dave working for him, and Dave, would every time cassettes would come in, because we didn't use cassettes in those days, every Every time a cassette would come in, he'd put a white cape over it so that it could be reused. <laughs> because I guess he didn't want to play anything for Don in case Don didn't like it. <laughs> and he valued his job. And God forbid he should send, give him a song that he didn't like. So he had, the, this, if you can imagine his record studio, his recording studio, which was in the back of the house, he had all these cartons. He lived up in Truesdale in this gorgeous street. In, in Truesdale, Cal, you know, Beverly Hills, a gorgeous Bel Air. Mm-hmm. Anyway, these cartons full of cassettes with white tape on them, <laughs> tons of them from all over the place. Anyway, apparently he was recording this girl named Jennifer Green, this darling girl from Australia, and he was recording her voice, and he had a song for her, and they liked it, and they were going to record it, and he stuck his hand down into a box and pulled out a cassette and put it in the other side of the cassette player where you record to. Yes. And was just about to press go. And he said, oh, I wonder what's on this tape. And so rather than record, he pressed play. And he heard the song that I had written. Wow. And sent blah, months, years, you know, years ago. And he heard it and he said, I liked that song better than the one we were going to do. Wow. And I peeled back the the tape, and it was your name wow. and your phone number, <clears throat> which reminds me to tell writers, always put your name on everything. Oh, yes. Not just the box. Put it on the CD. Yes. Put it, on, put it everywhere. 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 You make it, make sure, that, that, write it on the CD, make sure nobody, everybody knows if it gets separated from its container. That item from, represents you. It is you. That's right, and people all the time would send stuff where it was on the box, but not on the on the cassette yeah. or the CD, and then nobody would know who, who wrote it. But anyway, then I became good friends with this girl, this Jennifer, and one night she called me. We'd both been out of town. She said, Don just got back in town. You got back in town. I did. Let's go for dinner. I, okay. So we go for dinner at a restaurant on Melrose, and Don says, just sort of when the waiter came up, he goes, he says, you got any songs for Frank? And I said, songs for Frank Sinatra? Oh, my God. If I don't, I'll write one. And he says, okay, okay, I'm looking. So then as dinner went on, we had dinner, and we had our wine, and, and we started talking, and I, and I had this song, Nobody Loves Me Like You Do, which uh, was about to get recorded by Anne Murray. 
And Jennifer was living with Peter Marshall at the time, and he liked the song, and she liked the song. And I said, you know, and it was Peter said, it sounds like a hit. And and I said, why is it that everybody knows a song is a hit after it's after somebody else knows it's a hit or after somebody <laughs> records it? And Don said, I don't know, everyone's a Monday morning quarterback. And I said, what's a Monday morning quarterback? I'm English, and I've never heard that term before. And I don't follow football. So she, he explained, well, they play the game on Sunday, and then on Monday morning they they all go on about, you know, if only he had, if only he had caught that or run, you know. So I said, well, we do that in romance, too. We, uh, you know, we screw it up on Sunday, and on Monday we decide, um, you know, how it should have been done. Sure. And I said, do you think he would record a song called Monday Morning Quarterback? And he said, I don't know, write it. <laughs> and I swear to God, I wrote it in the car going home. Wow. <laughs> and then I stayed, I got home, and I worked on the piano till about 3 o'clock in the morning just finishing it. Just, you know, so there were initial ideas there, you know, but then I, you know, finessed it. And, and the next morning, as early as I could, 8 a.m., I called Don, and he said, and I said, I've got it. I've finished the song. Really? Oh, my God, what took you so long? And I'm very fast. I'm a very fast writer. So I, I drove up there to his house. He plays the song. He plays it. He plays it again. He says, Frank's going to love this. He said, I'm going to do a demo of this for you. And God bless his soul, he, um, he, he sang it, and he played piano on it. He was a guitarist. He was a very accomplished guitar player, but mm -hmm. he was not a pianist, and he was not a singer. So he calls um, Sarge Weiss, who was Sinatra's publisher, and, and he had an office at Goldwyn Studios, Samuel Goldwyn Studios. And he, so he, he calls Sarge Weiss, he comes up, he falls in love with the song too, or oh, I'm going to get this to him. He takes it, the, the CD or the cassette, in his, well, what was it? Was it a cassette? Well, it must have been. I don't know. Anyway, he takes it in his limousine, drives it to the airport, and sends it off to Sinatra, who is on tour in South America. And, and he's there with his wife, Barbara. And um, the next morning, uh, he, Sinatra calls Don, and he says, Don, you can't sing. <laughs> and Don goes, ah, oh, Frank, you know. This time, this is, I'm learning, I'm hearing this from, from Frank, from Don himself. Uh, he's, and he's not uh, oh, Frank, and he says, and, and furthermore, you're a lousy piano player. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, ah, oh, come on, come on. He says, but even you can't screw up this song. I'm cutting it. I love it. Wow. And so I was, uh, it was ecstasy, ecstasy for me to, to hear those words. How could it and, not be? <laughs> um, and then a, and a session was set, and then Frank said, uh, or Mr. S, as we all called him, Mr. S said, well, I, I don't want to record this right away. I want to get my chops up. I'm going on a world tour, and so I want to, when I get back, I'll record it. And he did. And, of course, I was sitting there biting my fingernails for six months. <laughs> in, in case, it, in but, case it, it went away, because that could yeah, do that, too. Yeah, so any, because, you know, in the music business or any of the entertainment business, you can, there is no such thing as a short No, thing. there's no... It ain't no, final no. till it's vinyl. Right. It ain't vinyl till it's vinyl. That's old. Nobody, you know, vinyl's come back, but it's still not there Yeah, yet. but that's from the first incarnation of vinyl. Yes. Um, anyway, so that was how that started and just if i may extend it by one little story mm -hmm. um so frank sinatra was invited by uh prince rainier to come to dinner uh, at, in monaco yeah and also um the prince's good friend freddie heineken the brewer of heineken beer sure was invited and that was the dinner party the three of them and uh you know freddie drove up there and because Freddie didn't fly, and the three of them had a dinner. And during the dinner, uh, Freddie confided in Frank Sinatra that he wrote music <laughs> and that he loved writing songs. And, and Frank said, "Well, you got to write me write me a song." And Freddie said, oh, "I don't have a lyricist." And Frank said, "Oh, I got this gal." <laughs> wow! And he set it up, and and I got a call. From uh, his, uh, you know, from his people, and I ended up uh, writing with Freddie, Freddie Heineken for 
I think Vinnie Falcone was his musical director at that time, and I think it was Vinnie who called me and said, you know, he wants you to write with uh, with Freddie Heineken. Wow. So when Frank Sinatra says he wants you to write with somebody, you, you do. You, and you, Freddie you write Heineken with and I became yeah. great friends. He was great. He was really talented. He came up with wonderful songs. He was he was more of a composer than a lyricist, obviously. He wasn't a lyricist, and he was Dutch. He would call me and say, Pamela, this, this, is, this is... Oh, no, he'd say... Holland, this is Holland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was this a, is Holland. He was a jokester. He was a, you know, he was a billionaire. He was the most successful man in in Holland, and he um, and he was a wonderful, warm human being. But we wrote a ton of songs, recorded some, did well with some. Later, that relationship, we were very good friends all his life till he died. And and uh, after he died, a friend of his was um, contacted me, but I didn't know it was a friend of his. I got a Plaxo. Which was this? It's this web. It's this actual um, uh, app, I guess. I don't know what it would have been called in those days, but it was something that kind of scoured the internet and updated address books on in your phone book. And uh, I don't think it exists anymore. And maybe it does. I don't know. But anyway, I got this plaxo that said uh, Dietrich Van Eck is uh, wants you to know your current address and phone number. And I thought, who the hell is that? I've never heard of him, and I wrote him back, and I, I, well, I was not going to write him back. I was just going to delete it, and then I thought, well, maybe it's somebody I met back in the days in Holland when I was writing for the Dolly Dots, right. and, I, and I, so I wrote back a polite letter, dear Didrik Van Eck, I have no idea who you are, and I'm not in the habit of giving strange men my phone number and address. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for writing. Boom. He He wrote me back instantly, and he said, Pamela, darling, I'm Freddie's friend, and Anyway, we ended up talking and uh, ended up, uh, he and I and my one of my favorite co-writers, Tom Harriman, um, Tom and I, and I ended up writing a, pro- a project for him for the Van Gogh Museum, and he sang it. Uh, and it was songs from the point of view of Van Gogh. It was a, I, I wanted to do it as if he was Van Gogh, singing as Van Gogh about the paintings that he did um, that were... Uh, it really from the point of view of uh, what he was going through in his life at the time mm. that he painted them. So, in other words, the sunflowers wasn't, oh, aren't these lovely sunflowers? Isn't it pretty? Uh, it was about his breakup with Gauguin. And um, so we ended, ended up doing this really spectacular album in strings, and, and we went in the studio at Capitol. It was wonderful. And Diedrich himself happened to be friends with um, the producer. Well, he, he represented the rights to this book on Soldier of Orange, which was a memoir written of a guy named uh, Eric Hasselhoff, mm-hmm. who was the biggest war hero in Dutch history. And um, and Eric uh, had the movie based on it with Rutger Hauer in yeah. 1979. And right. the project had been idle since then. It had been a Golden Globe nominee. And anyway, uh, so so Dietrich ended up representing the rights to the producer who wanted to acquire the rights to do a musical based on it, and he play and he was going to use some Dutch writers to do the show, and Dietrich said, "You've got to hear these American writers that I've been working with." And he gave him the album, and the next thing I knew, we had a you know phone com- conversation with the producer and. And I said to him, you know, well, and he said, what, what, do you, what would you do with this? I said, well, first of all, you can't put a war on a stage. You've got to put people on a stage <laughs> going through the war, and the war needs to be the backdrop. Yeah. La, 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 la. That storytelling is about people in conflict with people. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you've written gee, one of the biggest hits of all the musicals, you know, with the Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. So you certainly know all this stuff. And so I, so anyway, we got hired, and uh you know, we didn't know if it was going to what it was going to do, but it it did, as you mentioned at the beginning. And you're very do you do you enjoy that. did you enjoy writing musicals as much or more than writing just you know in one off songs? I loved musicals from the time I was a little girl. Mm-hmm. Steve, my parents, on my birthdays when I was in England, they would dress me up in a little organdy dress and little shoes and socks and a ribbon in my hair. And they'd take me to the West End, and we'd go for Cantonese food at this one restaurant that we all loved. And then we would go to see a musical. So I saw The King and I, and I saw My Fair Lady, and I saw 
Kismet, and I saw Kiss Me Kate. Those were the four that I remember. Mm -hmm. And I fell madly, passionately in love with musical theater. My stars in my eyes. And I mean, remember that I had musicians in my house all day long. That was, you know, music, music. My dad was rehearsing, practicing in the bedroom with mutes on his instruments and practicing. And, you know, I had, was around music. I loved all of this, just loved it. And so when I was about 18 and I was in L.A. or 19, I guess, 19 or 20, I don't know when I moved to L.A., uh, so I went to this one publisher, and he listened to all these songs I'd written, and they and he said, there's a lot of stories in this these songs. And he said, what's this one? You're breaking somebody else's heart. And I said, well, it was my father said I had to write a song about heart transplants. <laughs> 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 he said, well, wow, that's a great idea. So I wrote a musical at 18, 19, about a guy who gets a heart transplant and the heart is still in love with the other guy's oh, girlfriend. Wow, great idea. And uh, it was uh, pretty crazy. Uh, and then I started writing a series of musicals. I wrote 14 musicals. 14? Just to write them. You know, writing book, music, lyrics, everything. Just wrote them and wrote them and wrote them, trying to learn how to do it. Worked with a few directors mm -hmm. here and there, small productions. Uh, learning and no 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 that's you, that may have been a lovely lyric to write but it had nothing to do with the characters yes <laughs> you know how do you differentiate between this character and just somebody just singing this song you have to i know you love this lyric but you're going to have to scrap it and start over and make it come from the character's point of view and so that was the learning curve and by the time i got to soldier of orange I had written so many musicals and i'd also done the ascap disney workshops which michael kirker was from ASCAP, was kind enough to let me audit. He invited me to come. Was Stephen and, Schwartz involved at that time? Yeah, Stephen Schwartz is brilliant. It was Stephen Schwartz's thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I listened to all these erudite people talking about what was right and wrong with various shows written by very talented people. But I took copious notes. I'm probably the only person who ever took such copious notes of that thing. But I really, and I wrote down the things that were salient to how to do it. And believe me, every time I start a new show, I go back to these notes and I read them all over again to remind me what to do and what not to do mm -hmm. and what works and what doesn't mm -hmm. work and how to, how to you know, edit yourself. And um, so when I got this show, I was, I like to say, I was like a ripe plum ready to fall off a tree. When they said, are you, would you like to do the show? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 in other words, musicals are very much about storytelling, which, of course, you get in songwriting, too, but in a much smaller way. Um, and with a musical, you have to sustain it over the course of a good couple of hours. Oh, you know what, Steve? I love long form. I love writing long form. And, in fact, I have a project that I just did with Santino de la Torre, who is a Peruvian rock star. And uh, he, he, he asked ASCAP for... Uh, a, a, for a collaborator who writes English. He went to his first English project, and it was just going to be an album. We went and met at the Earth Cafe, and we talked, and we ended up writing a song. And Then we met again, and uh, we liked working together, and he said, I'd like to do an album, uh, and I'd like you to write it. And I said, how many of the songs do you want me to do? He said, all of them. And I said, oh, all right, well, then let's give it a, let's give it a topic. Let's, let's write a, something that a there's theme. a story you know, because I'm so, t I mean, not that I, if somebody calls me and says I want a song for my album, I'm there, or a song for a movie or whatever, I'm, I'm, I can tell the entire story in one song, but, um, but, and I'm very much a storyteller, I, like you are, I just like telling stories, and um, anyway, we wrote uh, an album, which is called, and I said, well, what's the name of the first, the first song, let me explain it, he said, it's called Forbidden. Oh, my God, I said, forbidden, That's, I love that. And I said, well, I don't want it to be too sordid, but anyway, ended up, we wrote this project about a guy from a kind of a good family who ends up falling in love with a prostitute, with a, you know, a bar girl. And it's sort of noir. It's a little bit old-fashioned. But the music is very Afro-Cuban, oh, fantastic Latin stuff. It's gorgeous. He had some of the best musicians in the world playing on this album. And he did record it over a long period of time. And finally, we got uh, a fellow named Googie, Googie, uh, Moogie, I'm sorry, <laughs> and he's uh, mixing it right now for us. 
and he fell in love with it too. And he just won the Grammy for best um, Latin album. Oh, so wow. he's he's a wonderful man. Oh my God, I just loved him on sight. He was terrific. So we're excited about that. And I keep doing these kind of projects that have at least some thread to them. And I'm creating them now. I'm trying to do more of them. I've you know I did one with a guy in Russia in Moscow who reached out to me and found me on my website and um, became a friend and uh, he was just in, uh, at my he and his wife were at my home in Vegas well, well, don't you agree that that's it's a bit of a lost art that for a long time as albums came out and you'd get 10 or 12 cuts on an album that a lot of artists would put or especially rock bands would put together albums that sort of had a thematic underpinning and then with the with the loss of albums and going to streaming and online, we've lost this ability to tell a story within ten or twelve songs, even though it's not a you know specific story, but it it has a thematic play to it. Yes, I t- I totally agree with you, and nobody's buying albums, of course. So this gives, if you do it this way, you end up at least giving people a reason to buy sure. the whole album. You know, why would you want to buy? The one song where he meets the girl, and not have the rest of the of the of the album where he where the whole story unfolds. You would want to hear the whole story. That's what I would think. Right. So that's my that's what that's I'm doing that where any, wherever anybody will give me the opportunity. So to do so it. so let's let's talk about process for just a few minutes. When you have when you've come up with that idea, what's the first thing you do? Where do you start? Well, you start by examining who the character is and what the dramatic need of each character is, mm-hmm. what what they want, and um, you also have to figure out where it's going and what you want to have happen by the end, and and what what are the stages. And on that particular project, we went through and we literally named each song because we thought about what the the next step in it was. Um, uh, one of them was called Jealousy, where he, you know, she, she, sing, she sings on it, too, that he's jealous of all the other men uh, that, you know, that, that are part of her life. So now you have then, something that it's about. It's about something. Yes, and then we talked about, then the, another song was Take Me Out of Here, My Love, which was okay. She finally agrees, much against her will, but she finally agrees that, yes, she's going to give this a shot. So um, this kind of thing, this is the kind of thing you do. You have to plot it. You have to think about the characters. You have to think about what you want to accomplish in each song. And all, at the same time, if you're a pop writer, you have to know how to write each song as a hit song uh, that's potentially a standalone song. Right. In a musical, not necessarily, because in a musical you also have to have story songs and banter and, you know, where everybody's singing and coming from character. And, and in character, that. yeah, all that. Yes. And not all of those songs are going to make it to, you know, be radio friendly. Of course not. No. But uh, but if you're doing a project like the one I'm describing, uh, where each song is a, is an entity unto itself, um, and they're all kind of more pop melodies, then you have to really think about how to to move the plot forward within the context. Mm-hmm. Do you do you sit I'm, down as you're working on a song and and uh, jot down lots of ideas about what should be happening within a song? Or does it just come to you organically? Yeah, I come, you know, once I start writing, I never really know where a song is going to lead me. I normally start every song with a title. And if, if somebody, if I'm working with a composer, and the composer gives me a piece of music, a melody, I listen to it over and over trying to find the intrinsic story in it, because every melody has a story mm-hmm. intrinsic in it that the composer has imbued it with by the mood he was in when he wrote it. And, you know, you have to find, is it a song about loss? Is it about love found, love lost, love yearned for, unrequited love? Is it a song about a fight? Is it a fight? Is it an, Is it angry? Is it hostile? Is it leaving? Is it coming to or coming back to there are so many permutations and variations it can be in the in the world of love and the world of relationships so you just have to find it and then you st- and, and once you find the spot where the title goes and then you build and then I then I'll sometimes I'll build four or five concepts around that title that um, lead me somewhere and I decide 
well, no, this one would be too country, this one would be too R&B, this one would be too rock, or whichever angle I'm looking for, or this one would be R&B, or this one would be rock, you know, and and a way to tell the story, because titles do not work across all genres. You just It's intuitive, you know, I've been doing it a long time. Of course, of course. <laughs> I'm still curious about you know the 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 way that you go at it. I, uh, clearly, at this point, um, you there are probably shortcuts that you can take because you've done so much of it. Um, but but most writers, when they start out, they don't have those shortcuts. They have to develop them. I I rarely cross anything out in my first draft. You keep everything. I don't I don't stop to rethink it or to second guess myself. I I my I discard. Ten ideas as as my pen is descending to the page, and there's an idea that's right there, and I put it down. And many of these ideas just come without thinking; they're just there. I always say that there are two kinds of ideas, Stephen. I know you'll agree with this. One of them is ideas that come to you, and ideas that come through you is the other one. Yeah, I agree. And ideas that come to you is where you come up with an idea and you write it down, and it's sort of good. And then you finesse it and finesse it and finesse it until it's right. And then it's like, okay, this is pretty good. I like yeah, this. Yeah. Then there's the idea that it's on the page and you look down and you go, where did that come from? <laughs> wow. And it's just an idea that literally flies out of the sky and lands on the page. And you've written it, but you did, it was autom- almost like automatic writing. So if you, if and you, those are the ideas. And sometimes they're crazy ideas and they're weird. And you go, I can't put that down. And then you go, why not? It is original. Sure. It is unusual. Absolutely. You know, if you if you start looking at a lot of the the great genius inventors and discoverers and creative people of the world, um, there's a almost a, a universal theme to what they say about where their greatest ideas come from, and almost all of them say things like it came like a bolt out of the blue, or it came through me. I'm just a conduit, or uh, it came from God, or whatever they say. And frequently, it's not. They didn't come up with it. It just they're just the the messenger, mm-hmm. and that's what you're talking about. Where it's just there. Where'd that come from? Right, right. And you have to learn not to discard them. Sometimes you'll think those thoughts when you're driving down the street, <laughs> and a title will come to you, or an idea will come to you, and you go, "Oh, I'm going to write. I'm going to write that down later and get on with it." And you never think of it again. Do you prefer do you prefer to have music first or words first, or does it not matter to you? I have written everything. I've written words first. For many composers, prefer they have a lyric in front of them. Uh, and then I've written to music uh, thousands of times. And sometimes people just give me a track, and I have to write the words and the music mm-hmm. to the track. And uh, sometimes it's, you know, I mean... Uh, I mean, it just depends on the composer and the project, whatever they're comfortable. And, and then more often than not, like if you go to Nashville, for instance, you sit in the room together and you bang it out together like Tim Pan Alley style. Right. And um, you, you, know, you overlap with ideas. The only thing I don't like is when you work with someone who is so anxious to be right that they discard everything you come up with. And that's tedious because you come up with a great idea and they go, no, let's make it this. And then it's like, okay, so you go with that direction, and then you come up with something else. No, that's... But they don't understand the process. They are so eager to be coming up with the right idea, with an idea that's theirs. And collaboration is such, an, is such a sensitive art. I'm a, a career collaborator. I mean, I, almost everything I've done has been a collaboration. Right. Once I realized that just even though I wrote my own early my early songs my sinatra and my others i i learned in some of these musicals i've written but i realized that you know composers want to write the music so they need a lyricist so i do come up with a few ideas during the collaborative process and i you know i will uh, you know throw them out there musically and they get incorporated into the song like but I don't ask for credit. I don't put my name. You know, it's not. It's not about that. For me, it's all about doing it. I don't. I really never worry about credit or money or success or any of it or getting it placed. I just. The only reason I do what I do is to do it. Well, that's most, the only reason, and that is absolutely honest and true. I, th- I think that that's the right way to be. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I would say probably nine hundred ninety-nine out of a thousand times, <clears throat> you're still splitting it fifty-fifty. So it's not. 
you know, it's yes. no, and the audience doesn't really have a clue whether the composer came up with a word here and you came up with a a, a, a musical lick nope. here. No, mm. nobody knows, and and that's right. It's, you shouldn't know. It's only when it's only when somebody writes all of it that you can place place it with one person. Um, Collaboration, you know, Tom, my my collaborator that I wrote Soldier of Orange with, Tom Harriman, he um, the way we often have worked is. Um, I write a lyric, and I give it to him, and it gives him ideas, and then he writes a melody that has absolutely nothing to do <laughs> with what I wrote. And then I write a lyric to the new melody and incorporate many of the ideas that I had, but I build them around the melody because, you know, especially with theater, it's got to be the right melody. So um, and it has the to pop ha- song, and- when, you, when you write a pop song for a show, you really need to do melody first because... It's all about melody and chords. But even but even in that case, song, even in that case, Pamela, it still has to be that it belongs in that whole show. It can't stick out like a sore thumb. Right, 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 right. Well, that's why writing the lyric first, so that there's a, a you know discussing first what you want to write about and knowing where you want to go with it that moment in the show, and you write that and then you discuss it together, and um, then I take I take it and give an initial approach to the lyric and quite often when we've done it that way steve and i rewrite the lyric i end up with is really really much better than the one i started out with sure well we, and and that's also the process isn't it um yes. where, where you where you work it and you keep working it until you get it to where you want or how often have you written a song i bet this has happened to you where you've just written the song and within minutes or hours it's there and you don't touch it again how often does that happen um, quite often. Quite often. And how often does it happen where you write a song and three weeks later you're still trying to figure it out? Never. Never. So if you start to struggle with the song, do you abandon it? If you... I, I, I can give songwriters this information, in my opinion. I mean, everything's my opinion, whether right or wrong. But if you, don't, if you cannot finish a song in a set, in a sitting... If you cannot finish the first draft of a song in a sitting, I should say, because, you know, you do fix it a little bit. If you can't do it, it is because you don't know what you want to say. Mm. And I, I came across uh, something that was absolutely fascinating one day. I, I, re- I had a you know, sudden bolt of realization, and I've taught this in all the classes I teach. And I've said to the class, I said, have you ever started a song that you didn't finish? <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> hands go up. Of yes. course, yes. Would you like to know why you didn't finish that song? Yes. You mean there's a reason? Yes, there is a reason. Because your initial idea, which hit you and was so powerful, is not the beginning of the song. It is the end of the song. Mm. So you have written this wonderful verse and chorus, and you can't finish the song because you don't know what to do. And that's because you already wrote the ending. Move that down to the bottom and write the, the gazenta, as, as um, Stephen Schwartz would say. The gazenta. The, gazenta the, the part that goes into that sure. part that you've written. And build the story. Give, give us the back story. Give us the, the set, give us the first verse, which tells us what's going on. Then write the second verse, which gives us the back story. And then you end up with the final verse, which is the conclusion and the summing up. So that's I think that's really valuable. So I want to go back to collaboration for just half a second here. What can you define what makes a, a collaboration work? I mean, I know it's like a marriage, but but can you define it or is it indefinable? I absolutely can define it. The, the art of collaboration is to let your collaborator be brilliant <laughs> and then put your name on it. Nothing to it. <laughs> <laughs> If you allow the other person in the room to do their do, you know, to, to create what they create and to have complete free reign, and you, you and instead of saying no, no, you say, yes, yes, I love that. Oh, that's great. And what if we, could we, and then they go, oh, that's interesting. Okay. And then let them go. Let them go. Let them come, come with it. And praise them and uplift them because at the end of the day, each collaboration is going to be one of you is going to have done more on each song. Sometimes you feel guilty because you did less, and you did much less. But I always bring up the song Arthur, Arthur's theme. 
in which from the movie um, Arthur. Yes. Was that Chris? Was that Christopher seen, Cross and Burt Bacharach and that whole? It was Christopher Cross, Burt Bacharach, Carol Bear Sager. Yes, and, and um, the boy from Oz. Oh, uh, Peter Allen. And Peter Allen came up with one line. One line, that. sure. If you get caught between the moon <laughs> and New York City. And that's the only line anybody remembers. <laughs> exactly. The next line after that is, I know it's crazy, but it's true. If you get caught between the moon and New York City, the best that you can do, the best that you can do, the best that you can do is fall in love. Mm-hmm. If, but that line, he got one-fourth of that song. Yeah. And... You know, it, that is what made the song a hit. Well, I mean, it, of course, the music, Baccarat's music was gorgeous, but it's like that is, to me, that's the art of collaboration. You know, you only have to come up with something that, if you come up with that thing, that, that secret thing that just makes that song happen. And I always say, too, if you come up with that line in the middle of writing and you think, oh, my God, this is such a great line. I don't, I don't want to put it in this song. It's just too good for this song. Then the question comes up, why are you writing this song if it's not good enough for the best line you ever wrote? <laughs> I say, throw out the song you're working on and go, God, I just got the best idea I've had in my life. Let's write another song. I've got this idea. Unless you don't believe in the collaborator, which brings up the question, why are you working <laughs> with this person? <laughs> so, all right, collaboration so... is like dating, you know? It's like you have to find somebody that you uh, that you feel comfortable Sympatico, with. Sympatico. Your right. ideas, met, you know, the simpatico thing, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so in a similar way, you've worked with lots of producers over time. Do you do anything now differently than when you first started out working with producers? How, how do you approach producers? What do you do? I find out what they want, what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, I I am given either a track or a melody, or I'm asked to come up with a, a song for an artist, and I you know want to know how you know how are they sexy? Are they religious? Are they are they, what is their what do they want to do? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, when I was working with Karen Souza, the very first song that I got to work with her on, and she is. Absolutely, this gorgeous, fabulous diva. She's terrific, and she's become one of my really closest friends in the whole world. I love her to death. She's great. And, in fact, I went down to Mexico City to see her perform for a huge, you know, sold-out crowd, and and she just knocks them down. Um, she sings somewhere between uh, Julie London and Marilyn Monroe singing Happy Birthday, Mr. President. Oh, wow. <laughs> she's got that wonderful presence. Anyway, the first song... I was working with her and Danny Thomas in his studio, and she says, okay, I want to do a song called Lie to Me. And I said, um, so is that about, you know, let's have one night together and lie to me that you still love me even though you're leaving. Is that what that's about, lie to me? And she said, oh, no, 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 I never lose. And <laughs> in my songs, that you know, and I, we we and we all smiled, and and I said, all right, so, what is what what are you looking for? And she said, we you know what, you know what you want. I know what you want. We both know what we both want. And so, if you want to go ahead and lie a little bit and say I'm wonderful and fabulous, but we know where this is going. <laughs> well, I thought that was so original and fabulous, and. And I lo- that's why I like to ask, you know, what do you want to do? Because if somebody gives me a new idea that I'd never thought before, I mean, that was a new thought for me. I never thought that thought before. Mm. And if somebody gives you that new thought that you never thought before, you write something completely new and fresh and different than anything you've ever done because you've allowed somebody else to give you a great notion and to, you know, kind of like... It gives you a prod, an electrical prod. It's 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 a it's a little bit of shaking some of the cobwebs off. Oh, it it makes you have to reconsider everything. Um, I, I mean, the first line of the song I wrote was "Lie to me." I think it's charming when you do. <laughs> <laughs> That's and the last line of the song was um, uh, "Till we sleep, you'll be inspired." When we wake, you'll be too tired to lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you work uh, um, 
hard at being surprising within the lyric? Oh, of course, of course. I mean, yeah, I learned in Nashville. I went to Nashville many times and wrote with some you know, people. I worked with Paul Overstreet, you know, wonderful writers mm-hmm. like that. Um, I, you know, I really learned at the feet of the greats. And one of the things I learned in Nashville, well, the main thing I learned in Nashville was how to turn around an idea. So that, and, and I must have written 20 songs before I got it, how to do it. Because they do it so skillfully, or at least they used to do it so skillfully. The wonderful writers, you know, Harlan Howard and all those guys. You know, my God, um, that it's the idea is how to take an idea and flip it over so that it means something quite different at the end of the chorus than it did at the beginning of yeah. the chorus. Yeah. A good example was Paul Overstreet's hit. On the other hand, and the song is about, and I think it was George Jones or somebody like that who sang it. But anyway, it's about. A guy who goes into a bar, and he meets this absolutely delectable morsel, and he's flirting with her and talking to her, and he suddenly gets the thought, wouldn't this be wonderful? Wouldn't this be a night to remember? Wouldn't this be great? And he's thinking about, should I, should I, should I? And then he says, but on the other hand, there's a golden band. (laughs) That is songwriting. Yeah. That is great songwriting. And that is what we all have to aspire to. I've got friends in low places. That, that's, a, that's a great lyric. That's a great song. It's one of the best. It's just, it's hilarious. It's heartwarming. You love him. You love everything. You, you know, you, you love where he's going. You love that he's real. And he just wants a normal person in his life. The, the, but he's that's Garth Brooks, and that's very he's very special in a lot of ways. He's a very good writer. Very and, good, um, and he's. A, I think he, he he co-wrote that one, I believe. With he he's a, he is a oh, he is a great cr- crossover writer too. I mean, he writes stuff that appeals way beyond country. There there are exceptional songwriters. One of my favorite <clears throat> songwriters is Billy Joel. Mm-hmm. Because his way of telling a story uh, it's, is so unique, it's unique. Yeah. And, and every word counts, every line counts, and this is what songwriters of today are not doing. No, nope. they are writing one good line, and then the rest of the song is filler. Yeah, I'm not saying when I say they, I don't mean the great unwashed. I mean it's just a general comment. But I wish songwriters. This is why I wrote books. Not for me, not for my aggrandizement. God knows nobody ever heard of me. I'm just a hard-working writer. That's what I do. And only people in the industry really know me. But I believe that it's really important to, to, to learn the craft of what you're doing, not just have this sort of feeling like, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm a good writer. I've been doing it for years, and people come and listen to me sing. That doesn't make you a good writer. It's learning the craft and why you use this word. Why use this word instead of that word? We're right back to the beginning of this yeah. conversation, yeah. Steve. <laughs> so so, so comes around full speaking, speaking of craft, I, I, I already know what your answer is going to be, but I'd like you to say it for the audience to hear it. Um, you, you spoke earlier about uh, thesaurus, and I know you use dictionaries, but you use rhyming dictionary too, don't you? I use a rhyming dictionary to bounce thoughts off of and, how do and you, ideas uh, or sounds off of. But I don't always use it. I used to use it much more. Well, you don't use it as a, I, you don't use it as a crutch, but you do use it as a tool. I use it as a tool just to to remind me of certain words. And there are two kinds of rhymes. There are pure rhymes which used to be the standard for Broadway. Yeah. Every single word had to have a pure rhyme. And now, Sondheim still believes in it. And I, Yes. And now all the pop writers are getting in on the Broadway thing, and so they're writing sound-alike rhymes, which is the used to be the country thing. And it's when you want to say something that's more meaningful and that the pure rhyme is only going to get you a... Um, you know, uh, a sort of meaning or a kind of a weird meaning. I went to see last night falsettos. It's the first time I saw falsettos. Yeah, William Finn. And, and that's, a, that's, for, uh, that's the first time I've seen it, and it was a sung-through musical. There wasn't a word of dialogue. The whole thing, and it was long, it was over two and a half hours, of just internal rhymes, internal rhyme schemes. And some of them were corny. Some of them were like, huh, what? But... By and large, it was so brilliant. 
it was so brilliantly written and I and I loved the way it was developed. It was it was long it was too long and there was you know, I had things about it, but my goodness, what an accomplishment. So long story Perfect long price. story very sh- long story very short. In the in the eighties I was while I was in Los Angeles, I was also a lighting designer in the theater. That was one of the things I did while I was trying to find my way as a writer. And I worked with William Finn on a show called In Trousers. As a lighting, I was the, the lighting designer of this very successful oh. show called In Trousers that was the precursor to Falsettos. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting that I would have seen it last night and brought it up? Yep, it is interesting. <laughs> In that same in that same theater in repertory that I also lit was a show called Live and Dolls, and that was written by Mark Shaman and and uh, Scott Whitman, who went on to write Hairspray and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So, Mark Shaman, God, what a talent! He's he's a Titanic talent, just fantastic. All right, so so let me ask you we're, just a couple more questions here. You, what do you do to stay on target and on deadline? When you when someone gives you a deadline, do you, is there anything special that you do? Um, I write on schedule. On I schedule. do not wait for the full moon. <laughs> if I have a writing thing, I have to do at 10 a.m., I do it. I sit down and I write it. So that's just discipline. Did you always have that discipline? Has it always been that yes, way? Yes, always, always. I, I used to, well, when I was working with Leon Silvers, and I wrote 112 songs in about a year and a little over a year, and he would drop off <laughs> like a CD with six tracks um, on Friday, and then I had the whole, I had the weekend to write all the songs. They were all going to get recorded on Monday or Tuesday, so I, I had to do it. I just and I would stay up until three o'clock in the morning. I had just gotten married, and my husband would go to sleep, and I would go in the living room, and I'd sit there with my dog and my on my lap and my cup of tea, and I'd sit there and write all the sexy love songs <laughs> <laughs> curled up on the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> so so okay so so you're in in a way for you it's easy you're just a naturally disciplined person you don't have to you don't have to do anything to get yourself motivated no 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 motivation comes from just uh, the good idea um one of the writers i'm working for with a very talented woman by the name of lily wilson she's a, a singer songwriter and I, I just love working with her. She's a delight, and she's a singer with a guitar and so on. And um, she called me and she said, "Well, when I come over, do you need me to have the beginning of a song? Shall I bring, um, shall I bring some melody? What, what would you like me to bring with me?" And I said, "Bring nothing. We'll have coffee. We'll talk. We'll write a song." And she started laughing. She said, "Really?" I said, "Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll come up with something great." And we came up with this really terrific song which she called ocean but it came in the conversation and we we just sat there having coffee in the living room and i just said uh, and she's and, and she said yeah i really i i'm you know i've been doing a lot i've done some albums and i've been around and i've and i've uh you know done some small uh, some smaller concerts and so on but she said you know what i just i just want to swim in the ocean and i i, I just want to you know that broad broadening out and and that among the notes that I wrote down was, I want to swim in the ocean, not knowing what I would do with it. But we ended up with a killer song with that with that concept. And we had written it in about two and a half hours. And uh, she left just joyful. Her husband's a record producer and a musician, and uh, he did a fantastic uh, track for her and with a rhythm that we had come up with that really pushes the song, the, this wonderful rhythm. And when you write a lyric, say the lyric again, I, I see something swimming in the ocean. What's the lyric? I want to swim in the ocean. Okay, I want to swim in the ocean. Does that wind up having some subtextual meaning other than literally swimming in the ocean? No, it's, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the ocean. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's all subtext. It has to, only to do with I want the larger, or I want the... Uh, um, what what it was I'm trying to think. I want to swim in the ocean, and my my first line was out in the great big blue. She changed that line to something else, but that was my line. I want to swim in the ocean, out in the great big blue. Lift my feet off solid ground, like I've uh, t- t- learned my taught myself to do. Uh, I've I've sw- been too long in the shallows. I don't want to live like that. 
you've got to jump in if if you, if I want to swim in the ocean. So it's so that, it has that was the course. It has ocean and swimming metaphors, but it's not about that. Not about swimming at all. Yeah, I think that's those are the those are to me those are the great lyrics when it you're saying something but it means something else. I think that's true for almost all writing, but yes, yes, and we and if you use those metaphors, you have to uh, build. You have to put an antecedent. People don't understand antecedents anymore. That if you write about locks and keys or or swimming in oceans, you have to set up. You know, the door is open or the lock is. Uh, you know, you have to set something up in the verse so that when you come to the chorus and you use that metaphor, it has meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. So we, we believe it or not, we've been talking for an hour and 20 minutes, and um, we're going to wrap this up with the famous last two questions. So you, you've clearly worked with tons of people over time, lots of different partners and lots of our great artists. Um, do you have an oddball or a weird or quirky or funny or just outrageous story to, to share? Oh, I have lots of them, but here's here's a funny one. I was um, I was in a, the gynecologist's office. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect and place to write a song. I was like, and I was there in the stirrups, mind you. <laughs> and the doctor was, you know, with the check, you know, doing the pap smear or whatever. And he turns <laughs> around and he and he read, and he looks around the towel, and he looks at me. He says, "Do you have any songs for Rita Coolidge?" <laughs> She's my next patient. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? I said, oh, yeah, I have this one. And uh, so as soon as so we hurried up and got done, and I rushed over to my publisher's office and got back there in time to hand him the, I called, you know, make me up a cassette for a so, CD or whatever. So did he get her in the stirrups and then hand it to her? Something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Oh God! But anyway, so those are the kinds of things that happen. I don't know if that's. Uh, um, that's and, uh, I've got I've got you know plenty of of stories, but um, uh, I, well, my first my first thing I ever had to write uh, was I worked for a, a jingles company called Dynamic Productions in L.A. <laughs> okay, and uh, and uh, I was getting paid seventy five dollars a jingle, and that was, that was a fortune for me. And so the guy uh, who comes into up to my desk and he says, "Well, okay, we're, we've got this chicken product that we have to write a jingle for, and it's sort of tinned chicken, canned chicken, and uh, and it, it looked quite dreadful. But anyway, he shows it to me, and I said, "Okay," I said, "How about the trick and picking chicken is we pick and rich chicken to pick?" <laughs> and he said, "Oh, that's terrible. Go back and write something else." Give, your, give it some time. You can't just come up with something that quickly like that. <laughs> I mean, I literally answered him in the same sentence. <laughs> so I spent the afternoon just doodling on my pad and uh, probably writing a song or something. And uh, the next morning, I came in the office, and the client came in. And they opened a can of the chicken, and we all got to taste it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the client, and then and then, and I introduced to the client. I'm smiling, you know. And this guy who ran the company, he said, "Okay, Pamela, tell him what you've come up with." And I said, "The chicken picking chicken is picking which chicken to pick." And the client goes, "Oh my God, I love that!" <laughs> and my boss says, "See, I knew you could come up with something." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad he didn't take credit for it. Oh, uh, no, that that happened on other occasions. But. I'm sure it has. All right, so so uh, last question. Do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip for those who are trying to break into the industry or find their way into it, or even those who are in a little bit but trying to get to the next level? Okay, this is this is what I believe. You have to write to write. You cannot write for what will happen to your songs mm -hmm. or how famous you hope to get or whether you'll get an album or whether you'll be on a marquee or you'll get on television. You write to write. That can be the only reason to do it. And don't get caught up in outcome. The outcome is the most limiting thing in the world because nothing happens the way you think it will. What You heard my story about how I met Frank Sinatra, and, yep. you know, years and years and years and years later, I got this show that is the most successful show in Dutch history. Through that meeting with 
drank through Don Costa and this girl at a party when I was 18. I mean, all these steps that lead you somewhere, you don't anticipate where they will lead. And you cannot know. Think about it. You go in a restaurant and you order a hamburger and it doesn't look anything like the thing you wanted to eat. <laughs> yes. And it's not cooked the way you wanted. And the bun is weird. And the this and the, you know, the lettuce is is not is wilted and you know, nothing is right about it. but you ordered something you always order and you know what it is and that's the point you don't know what anything is going to end up like you can go to the dry cleaners and not get yourself dressed nicely or do your hair or make yourself look good and you can have had a chance to meet somebody there who would just standing there in line waiting for his dry cleaning that you would talk to. Or you could meet somebody in London on a train, sitting on a train. You could meet, I met people in elevators. I met, you never know where that break is going to come from. And sometimes the break is not what you think. The break, you think you want to be a musician. But the break comes from somebody's brother's uncle who has a studio and needs somebody to come in and help in the studio and you end up becoming an engineer and going to engineering school and that turns out to be your talent the music engineer rather than as a writer even though you write on the side so don't try and pre-plan or pre-plot what it ought to be and and don't give up your day job because you need to have an income and a life you need to have a social life and be able to eat and have a nice car and live a life if you sit in a little room writing songs hoping to be famous that isn't what's going to do it. Uh, you know, I met a guy who, who was a hairdresser, and Whitney Houston came in to have her hair cut. And he pitched her a song. He had been writing songs for a long time. Ended up with a big career. Wow. Because she cut the song, and, you know, the rest was history. He became a producer. He did all kinds of stuff. So these things, you know, that was so random. You can't plan every, for that. Every, you, 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 don't you agree that random uh, is, yeah. it, it's all random. It's just, who would think I'd written 14 musicals? Who would think I would get asked to write this musical about a war hero in Holland and that they would build this theater? May I just tell you about this theater? Sure. I've just got to, it's in an airplane hangar. They, they, it's on the airstrip where the Nazis landed in Germany. It was the Queen's airstrip where they occupied Holland. Um, Hitler had made a treaty of neutrality with Holland, and he broke it because he wanted to get to the ocean. So they invaded. Anyway, this show is built, they built the theater, and it's 10 stationary stages in a circle. Hmm. And in the center is a revolve for the audience, like a clamshell. And the audience sits in that and spins around to face the various stages. One of the stages that the director conceptualized with the uh, set director, <clears throat> was it is a beach, and it's got 360,000 cubic liters of water and waves and sand dunes and a pier and an animated sky. Oh, and it's just... That's huge. It, it's huge. And then another stage has a full-size airplane on it, a World War II Dakota plane. These are things that, I mean, I wrote, I co-created the story, and I wrote the lyrics. I never, in, in a, I didn't think of those ideas. It's everything is a, the universe brings together the people that it brings together. So this is why being a collaborator and being a part of something is so much more important than wanting to dominate something or wanting to try and push it in a direction. Let it find, let every, always let everything find its way. Mm -hmm. I hope that wasn't too long of a... No, 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 that's very valuable. It's very, very good stuff. You know, uh, um, some of it, there's a little bit of what what many people would call luck. But, you know, the, the old adage I think holds true that luck uh, favors the prepared mind. So if you're, if you are, have done your due diligence and you're paying attention, that increases your chances of having these experiences you're talking about and not letting them pass by. Luck is preparation meets opportunity. Mm, yep, yep. Yeah, I think that's very good. I think that's very valuable. So I, I do have one suggestion for you for a song lyric, and I just want to give it to you now. It's called I Only Have Phlegm for You. Patooey. <laughs> 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 it's going to be a mass... I can't it's a goodbye song. It's going to be a massive hit. <laughs> 
<laughs> you, you're you're going to sell millions of boxes of Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll, that'll be the end of that. Pamela, this has been a great delight to have you on the show. I'm so happy you came, uh, you know, got on the show with me today to talk about your your, your career, your life, and how this all works. Because, um, I, you know, I think you're an inspiration. Oh, thank you. Well, you're certainly an inspiration to many, many people. I looked at your website and your wonderful, all these interviews that you've done, and I've just started to listen to them. And my goodness, you're really bringing something to people. This, the information that you can learn from other people who've done it really gives you something to think about and something to inspire you. And Indeed. Inspiration is half of it. Indeed. Well, well, thank you for saying so, and, and I'm very grateful for you coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Steve. Pleasure to meet you and to talk to you. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.